Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. It's great to be back with you all for this episode. I've been doing this for about two years and haven't had anyone from my parish on yet. That changes today. Um, my guest is Kristen Van Tilburg. She's a lay ecclesial minister at my parish, and she has a great YouTube channel called Catholic Bible Studies, and she is a great teacher. She's taught things from the book of Revelation, Matthew, Old Testament. Kristen, great to have you on. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for coming on. I've been wanting you on for a while. And, you know, as when we're together, we're always doing something with other people and it slips my mind. That's what happens when you get older, I guess. So, <laughs> but yeah, you have a great conversion story and that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. So maybe, maybe you can start us from the beginning. Like how did you get introduced to Christianity in general? Sure. Well, I grew up uh, practicing church going Lutheran. My mother was the, uh, the children's ministry director at a Lutheran church. I sang in the choir. I played handbells. I was involved. And yet, I, and I believed the Christian faith my entire life. But for all that, I wasn't a very spiritual person and I wasn't very interested in my faith. You know, it was something that I believed was important. And I showed up every Sunday, at least until I went to college. And at that point, I didn't read the Bible on my own. I rarely prayed. It seemed to me like God had created the world and sent us Jesus. And then it just off doing his own thing for 2000 years. So I didn't have a personal relationship with God. I didn't know such a thing was possible. So that's, that's where my faith stood by the time I was a young adult. Okay. Which brand, of, I don't want to say which brand, but which Lutheran denomination did you grow up in? All of them. All of them. I okay. went to a, uh, yeah, I, I went to a Missouri Synod church in the school before I was 10. After that, it was ELCA, and then the church broke off from ELCA and became independent. Okay. So conservative and liberal, and in right, between. Right, right. Yeah, I was going to say, because Missouri, the Missouri Synod is very, very conservative. So <laughs> They are. So when did you first start finding that inkling to delve deeper or d delve deeper into Christianity? Find out what it was about more. Well, God did things to get my attention. And looking back, the first big moment where he shook up my world to get my attention was in 2003, when St. Dominic showed up. I was a graduate student in Bologna, Italy, and I was a good tourist. So one day I walked into one of the old churches and I had a routine when I visited churches. Normally I would just, you know, look at all the artwork and, a, you know, from right to left and then kneel and say a prayer and then go. But that day as I walked through the doors of the church, I felt something pulling at my chest, pulling me forward. And I couldn't explain this, but I went with it. I walked all the way forward to the front of the church. And at the altar, I took a right and there was an enormous side chapel with a big marble tomb at the end, and in the middle, a pillar with a golden box on it. And this golden box seemed to be radiating waves of, of beauty and joy, and I felt so drawn in, I couldn't explain it. I started walking in circles around this box, just staring at it. So what was in that box? Well, <laughs> I didn't want to break the spell. I just kept walking around it and walking around it. And finally, I took a close look to put my face right in there. And I was uh, eyes to eye sockets with a human skull. It turned out it was a reliquary. Oh. And then I decided to look and see who, whose skull it was. And it was the skull of St. Dominic. St. Dominic being one of the, the great evangelists of the church. He, right. uh, he lived, he was born in Spain around the 1200s. And he spent most of his career trying to... Uh, to preach to the Cathars, to various heretics, and he found the Dominican order of, uh, of studying and preaching. So uh, apparently he took one look at me and decided I needed help. So what was going through your mind at that moment? Because like you said, you're drawn over, then you look down and bam, there it was. What was going through your mind? Well, it, funny enough, I should have been fighting, but I couldn't be. There was so much goodness radiating off of his skull and I knew that what I was feeling was his presence and I knew I was supposed to speak to him and so I, I, I had no idea what I was doing but I pulled up my courage and said buongiorno no reply <laughs> no reply I tried again salve 
No, still no reply. I kept walking around him in circles, puzzled, and finally I went, uh, I don't know what language you speak, and, and I don't know why I'm walking around your skull like an idiot. And then you replied. <laughs> I, uh, let's see. I, I, I said, well, I suppose you're wondering why I'm walking around your skull like an idiot. And he said, not really. People used to do it all the time. Used to do it all the time. People used so, to do it all the time. So were you the only one in this chapel at this point? I was the only one in this entire church. Wow. Completely empty. Cold February day. Wow. So when you heard that reply, what were you, I guess, what was your response? Cause especially coming from the background that you were in. Right. Well, I, when I heard those words, again, not, not so much through my ears as in my mind, I saw without intending to, I saw all of these people dressed in medieval clothing. I saw the, the coffin of St. Dominic being processed down the street. And I was suddenly part of this crowd. And then the scene vanished. I was completely confused. You know, the, the wheels in my brain just wouldn't turn for anything. And finally, I, I said, relics. That's right. Catholics believe in relics. I don't believe in relics. Dominic laughed. <laughs> and, and I think as you told the story before, is like around this point, you left the church. Was that, is that correct? I, I did. I, I got flustered. I didn't know what to do. I, told, I, I finally said, look, I, you know, I don't believe in this Catholic stuff. And I walked away and I walked out the front doors of the church. And by the time I'd gotten outside, I decided that all of that was my crazy imagination. It had never happened. Did St. Dominic make any other appearances later on? Yes, in fact, he did three years later. And during those three years, God did an awful lot to warm me up. I went home. I... I became depressed, which was a big eye opener. I realized that the, the big important career I had in mind was not going to make me happy. And I read the Divine Comedy, which really opened up my heart to seeking God. I, I realized I had to organize my life not around career, but around love. I went home to Arizona, married my best friend, and really started seeking God. I started going to church with my husband. He is a, he's an evangelical. But funny enough, I wasn't so much finding God at his church is in the medieval history classes I was taking at the U of A. I took medieval history and Byzantine history and started studying all of this Catholic theology and reading all of these Catholic saints and realizing that these were amazing people who were much closer to God than I was and I wanted to be like them. So. So, so what, kind of, what kind of books were you reading at the U? I remember the first assignment we ever had, first week of the, my medieval history class, we were assigned the Passion of Saint Perpetua. Oh, wow. It, the earliest Christian writing by a woman, I highly recommend it to anyone. I'm sure you can find it on the internet. It's not that long. As she wrote around 200 AD, just before she was thrown to the wild beasts in the arena at Carthage. She was, she and her, her slave, Felicity, were studying to become Christians. They were catechumens. And her testimony is incredible. My daughters love that story. We've watched that movie so many times, the cartoon version. Mm -hmm. And they actually made me go and buy her diary for them. So they have the diary in the room, which is pretty cool. I'm like, you can read it all you want. I don't care. Go ahead. That's read it. <laughs> but that actually opened up my eyes to the idea that maybe God didn't just go away 2000 years ago and has been on vacation. You know, God sure seems like he's active in the life of Perpetua. And that started to get the, the ball rolling again. Okay. So tell, tell us a little bit about that, how that ball started rolling for you. Well, we all, after St. Perpetua, we read St. Augustine, we read St. Benedict, we read St. Bernard of Clairvaux, and I loved his writings. I loved how much he loved God. So, and I remember even praying at the time, God, make me a Christian like Bernard of Clairvaux. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for, right? Exactly. So you're at you, the... Too long, yeah. I was say you're almost having like a theology class at the University of Arizona, you're reading all I these, all these great saints. So, and the teacher wasn't Catholic, but I was getting quite the Catholic education there. It was wonderful. So you're reading Augustine, Bernard of Clairvaux. What, and, what about their writings like clicked for you? Oh, well, also when I read a Perpetua, she talked about uh, when she was in prison awaiting her death, how she had visions of her younger brother who had died and how her younger brother was in a place where he was thirsty, needed a drink, and she needed to pray for him that he would be comforted and helped. Oh. And 
she prayed for him. The other people in prison prayed for him. And later on, she had a vision of him happy and playing with the other children. And I realized that this was purgatory and that the Catholic church had been teaching purgatory since at least 200 AD. You know, I'd always heard that was one of those, you know, things that got invented in late medieval history that the right. Lutherans had to protest. No, no, this goes all the way back to the early church. And even before, I mean, the, the Jews in the time of Jesus, they prayed for their dead. So this is, this is part of Christian history from the earliest time. So I was learning that Catholic theology was correct, that it was older, that it had a direct line of connection back to the Bible. Did you have any struggles uh, dealing with the concept of purgatory when you realized it? No, I really didn't. That came quickly. I, real, I, I, I read her testimony and went, this is true. So oh, wow. I started to be converted little by little intellectually. That year was my big intellectual conversion. Spiritually, what happened next is after, while I was taking these classes, I showed up at the Catholic Church on campus at the U of A for Ash Wednesday. And again, I walked in the doors and I felt drawn in, just that pulling in my chest. And there was a man up front in a black and white robe and he gave the homily about how he used to be Protestant, but then God called him to become Catholic and you never know what God's gonna do with you. And I'm laughing and going, ha, ah, God's funny. Oh, what a, what, a, what a great homily. And then he said, well, you know, we, we pray these prayers every morning, you know, morning prayer, you should, you should all come and pray with us. And I went, that's a great idea. I can pray for the 40 days of Lent. So the next day I show up and I'm the only person that's not dressed in one of those black and white robes. So I sit and pray with them, you know, turn my, turn my psalm book right side up and try to follow along. And at the end, they all start singing, oh, light of the church and end with Holy Father, St. Dominic, pray for us. And I realized I've just crashed a group of Dominicans. <laughs> and then he makes another appearance. That's great. And he, yeah. And at that point, I started thinking about what had happened three years ago and wondering, wait a minute. I started praying about whether, whether the saints were really praying for us here on earth and whether, you know, having this relationship with them is something that God intended for us. And I studied and I prayed. Studying it became very obvious very quickly, looking at the book of Revelation, that yes, the saints in heaven are alive and praying for us. Absolutely. But I still wasn't sure whether I was allowed to pray to them. On the eighth day of Lent, and I've been going to morning prayer every day, I asked God, you know, please answer this question for me. You know, Catholics and Protestants have been arguing over this for 500 years. I don't know how, how I'm supposed to find the right answer. And as I was driving in the car on the way to church, I prayed to St. Dominic because I felt like God was nudging me saying, you'll know if you try. And so I said, St. Dominic, you are passionate about the truth when you were alive and teaching. And I want to know the truth. Please pray for me that I would know the truth about praying to saints. And I heard a reply. He said, you're going to love this. And I said, what? And bam, I was driving in a car, 40 miles an hour, and I have a vision of heaven. Wow. I see the scene in heaven. And I see, I, I just feel how much they love us. And I'm completely overwhelmed. So did you have to pull over your car at that point? Or did you just keep driving? No, I just kept driving. It okay. was pretty funny. I, I felt like some of them were, were like were had a particular interest in me that they were praying for me and I didn't know who they were yet but I felt so loved like I'd never felt that love before in my life and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that these heavenly friendships were a way of connecting with God and experiencing God's love and God's direction okay so you're and praying to then, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry no, go ahead go ahead I was gonna say and uh, it, it all started to vanish. And I was like, don't go. And then I heard a voice say that if I didn't open my eyes right now, I was going to miss my turn. <laughs> <laughs> so you're praying to say, Dominic, you have this vision of heaven. So were your, were your concerns about um, the whole community of saints praying to the saints? Was that done at that point? Or did you still have struggles going forward? Oh, 
I still had struggles going forward. My biggest struggle was that my husband was not only a devout evangelical, he was planning on becoming a pastor. And I didn't think like, I didn't think I could become Catholic. I didn't think that was possible. I thought it would be too hard on my family and far too hard on my husband. And so I put all that up in a box and put it on the shelf went, oh, that's good to know that it's good to pray to saints. And I finished out my 40 days of Lent and went, great, I'm staying Lutheran now. I'm done. But God wasn't going to let me stay there. Yeah. And your husband's a great guy, by the way. And I, I, I'm so jealous of his beard. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, he's fantastic. He's awesome. He's been, and I talk about how in my conversion story, I was so worried about what he'd think of me, but he's been tremendously supportive to me over the years. Oh, absolutely. And he comes and helps out at the parish every now and then as well. He's a great guy. So. Oh yeah. And he's the one that films and edits my classes for YouTube. He's been great. Yeah, absolutely. So you put the, so you put it up on the shelf and you, did you just go about your life? At what point did you have this? Was there like this awakening moment? Like, um, I can't be on the shelf anymore. Yeah. And it came through pain, which is God's big wake up call. Right. Right. So about a year after that, I gave birth to my first child and the birth went really, really hard. And afterwards, uh, I, I had trauma and I could not get over the birth. I kept having flashbacks. I couldn't sleep. And this went on for about six months. Finally, one morning, I wake up thinking, I've got to get to mass. That was a strange thought for a Lutheran to be having on a Friday morning, but I decided to roll with it. I looked up mass times for a nearby parish and took my baby. And we went to healing mass. So I got in line, got anointed with oil and just felt completely out of place. I had no clue what I was doing. And at the end of mass, I left, went home. I had absolutely no expectation at all of anything. Didn't even know really why I was there. But that night I slept and the night after that, the night after that. And I realized that I was healed. These, these memories that have been tormenting me. They were just gone. Yeah, that's, that's really no coincidence. <laughs> really, you wake up saying you have to go to mass and it's a healing mass and you've been dealing with, with a trauma, like you said. So it was like God had that plan to get you there. That's great. Wow. No, every time I hear your story, Kristen, I'm just like, wow. It's like God had his hand in it, like all the way back in Italy. <laughs> and here we are in Tucson, Arizona, all these years later. And it's, it's going on. It's so much fun watching him weave his tapestry. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, he was, he, he draws straight with crooked lines, right? That's the old saying. Oh yeah. So after this heal, after this healing mass, you, you, you're, you're finally getting some sleep. What happens next? Well, I was, I was still not quite ready to walk back into a Catholic church again after that. I was being incredibly stubborn and God sent me Mary for my final push. Two months after that healing, I, I read an article in Reader's Digest on hospital errors and once again, you know, stayed up that night, just mad at the world all over again. And the next night I was lying in bed going, oh God, don't let this come back. I thought you healed me. You know, God, I know you healed me you know, what's wrong? How can I make it right? And I felt like he was saying, you're not praying to the saints. And I said, what? You know, Catholics don't have to pray to saints. This isn't, this isn't something required of anyone. You know, why should you require it of me? Well, God didn't seem impressed by my theology. <laughs> you know, when God tells you to do something, you just need to do it, right? Christianity 101. Absolutely. And so I went, I better pray to a saint. Who do I pray to? And St. Dominic didn't seem quite right. And I went, well, who do Catholics pray to? They pray to Mary, right? I didn't know a Hail Mary. So I just went, hi, Mary. And I felt her wonderful, loving, motherly presence. And I knew right away that she'd prayed for me. I was healed. And I said, thank you, Mary. I'm so sorry. I've never paid attention to you before. What with, you know, being Lutheran and all. And I promise you, I will not ignore you again. And from that point on, I, I went to sleep. And from that point on, I was determined that I was going to do things God's way. That was, that was my fiat, you know, that was my saying yes to mm -hmm. God. So at what point did you, after, at what point after this, did you contact the parish to start the whole process of RCIA? It was a couple months after that. I started going okay. to St. Francis de Sales and contacted the parish and began classes. And 
2009, I was confirmed Catholic. Yeah, and you've been very busy since then. So you've 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 <laughs> done, you've done uh, teaching um, yeah, everywhere. So tell us a little bit a little bit about your ministry, how God has been using you uh, since you came into the church. So what's been fantastic is I think a lot of people tell their conversion stories, and you get the idea that all the fun and excitement ends with the conversion. You know, you you enter the Catholic Church and you live happily ever after, and life from that point on is pretty boring, right? No, right. not a chance. <laughs> Just like I think for the Apostle Paul, you know, the, the road to Emmaus, you know, that, that was a big deal, but that was only the beginning. Right. So God, God keeps working in our lives. It's the most incredible thing. So for me, when I was in RCIA, uh, God sent me a new saint, uh, St. Francis de Sales. I mean, patron saint of the parish. I thought I'd start reading him. And he prompted my moral conversion. You know, I, I, I knew I had sin in my life. But reading his books made it so clear to me for the first time that this is what I need to stop doing. This is what's poisoning my soul. And God will help me. And so I experienced first that intellectual conversion and the spiritual conversion and then a moral conversion. And I started getting a lot more peace in my life once I started getting some of this garbage out of it. And then after that, it's funny, I can, I can trace the, the stages of ministry from which saints God decides to send my way. <laughs> after I was confirmed, God sent me St. Augustine. I started reading him, mm. and I started reading all the church fathers. St. Ambrose was the other one that really struck me. And I, I, I was already enamored of Catholic theology, but at that point, I was really enamored of Catholic theology, was reading the church fathers, was really learning just so much about how to draw close to God and, you know, Catholic theology now and then. And then two years after I'd been confirmed Catholic, I was at mass and it was Easter vigil. And I felt the presence of St. Augustine very strongly during communion. I felt like, I felt like he came into me and I was, I was filled with his presence. And I struggled greatly with social anxiety at that time. But suddenly I felt like my social anxiety was completely gone. And I went, God, what do I do with this? And he said, go join the RCIA party. So I did. I went and crashed the RCIA party of all the new Catholics and went and congratulated them and told them how wonderful it was that they'd just been baptized and how happy I was for them and got into these great conversations, started kind of counseling people. And at the end of the party, one of the deacons came up to me and said, Kristen, would you like to teach RCIA? Just out of curiosity, which deacon? Um, oh boy, it was Deacon Ty Tran. Ty, okay. Yeah. I see Ty doing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you start teaching RCIA. And how long were you helping with RCIA? How long were you teaching RCIA before you started going into like the lay ecclesial program? So I started teaching RCIA in 2011 and just Two years later, I applied for the lay ecclesial ministry program and spent okay. four years doing that. Okay. Four years doing that. And you've been busy mm -hmm. since then, <laughs> obviously. I've been busy since then. So what, yeah. what, what, what kind of things have you been teaching at the parish and how, how, how have you been helping the parish since then? All right. Well, I'll move on to my next saint. After right. St. Augustine and St. Ambrose, he got Joshua from the Old Testament. That surprised me that God would send me an Old Testament saint. Yes. But it turned out I needed an awful lot of courage where I was at at that point. I was, I was really feeling called to step up and teach more, not just RCIA, but to teach adult education classes in the parish. And that, that wasn't something anyone was really doing at the time. And there were a lot of roadblocks in place, you know, mm -hmm. both explicit and implied. So I, I needed to push through a lot of that. And that was difficult for me. But, you know, I prayed a lot and... God helped, and boy, I had the intercession of Joshua going on. So started teaching Matthew Kelly books in the beginning, uh, Four Signs of a Dynamic Catholic and Rediscover Catholicism, and those were really well received, and I just felt like people in the parish were, were so hungry to learn more about the faith, and it was, it was really encouraging. Yeah, definitely, I, I, and I remember that vividly when you started doing it, because like you said, no one was really doing it. Um, there were like some Bible studies mid-morning on Wednesday, but who, who was really able to go? <laughs> so you're teaching the Matthew Kelly books. You move into books of the Bible. Um, yes. Know. So 
which, what was your favorite book of the Bible to teach through? Oh, wow. Oh, that's hard to say, but it's got to be, it's, it's got to be uh, when I taught the David series, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, because after Joshua, David showed up and the life of David really just, it, it, it informed my life at the time so much. And so studying through first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, I felt like I was, you know, being taught what I'm supposed to be doing right now in my life. I mean, the lessons right then I was learning were, were joy, peace, gratitude. And also we got into foster parenting, ended up adopting a couple of kids. And that was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So fruits of the Holy spirit, you're teaching those, you're experiencing those. Um, mm-hmm. you, you started fostering your, your two great children that you had adopted. How long has it been now? About a year and a half, two years. You just adopted them. Yeah. Two years ago now, two years. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you, you did that and then the pandemic starts. So how, how, how has your ministry been go- going since the pandemic? I know it's been a challenge for everyone. Oh, the pandemic I mean, brought pretty much everything to a screeching halt. You know, I can't teach classes in the church right now. Uh, I've still been involved with RCIA, have been, you know, continually for the last 10 years, but God's used this time too. You know, this has been my retreat time. This has mm-hmm. been the time where I, I get to pray and regroup. And he's, he's sent me a couple of new saints to help, uh, help teach me contemplative prayer. That's been an adventure. So I'm really curious to see what comes next. Okay. I'm curious, which saints? I, I'm, I'm not ready to say at the moment. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> still too new. All right. Yeah. And I want to talk to you about your story because you had this strong experience with personal interaction with saints that have, you know, helped you through the church and a lot of conversion stories are, you know, seeking for truth. I started reading the church fathers and I realized that the early church was Catholic, et cetera. So I guess for the listeners out there, how important are the saints in our faith? The saints are incredibly important they teach us not only what the church has always believed, but there are mentors, there are guides from heaven, there are big brothers and sisters cheering us on. They encourage us, they can guide us if we listen to them. Just like when we read the Bible, we can hear, you know, God speaking to us, especially in Lexio Divina, you know, especially if we keep our ears open, you know, that verse jumps out and tells us just what we need to know. Well, the saints speak the same way. We'll be reading their writings, we'll be praying, and they'll, they'll find a way to tell us just what we need to know. We really can form those relationships with them. And that's something that I think is missing in a lot of you know, modern day American Catholicism. We think of you know, praying to the saints as something that, you know, that maybe Catholics used to do more, but that's something that's still very much a, a way for us to draw close to God today. Right. Church triumphant. And they're, they're there for us. They worship with us. Definitely a big part of our faith. Exactly. So Kristen, for anyone out there who's listening to this and maybe is considering joining the church, any words of wisdom for them? Just follow God. If God is drawing you, don't be afraid. He knows what he's doing. Amen. Well, Kristen, thank you for your time today. I thank you for coming on. And everyone check out the YouTube channel, Catholic Bible Studies. So much great stuff there. You got the Matthew Kelly stuff that she taught, Matthew, Revelation, uh, the Kings, all that's there. You'll, you'll be blessed by it. So, Kristen, thanks again, and God bless you. Thank you so much, William.